We've been to all four corners of Britain in our quest to interview the great and good of entertainment. Comics, actors, writers, politicians, singers, dancers and choreographers. It doesn't matter who they are. They've all given me their own take on the world they live in and have, in their own way, helped to define what makes Britain great. So join me and my assistants as we get another insight into the marvellous and enigmatic world of showbiz here on Beyond the Title. Ian Lee began his career on the British stand-up circuit during the late 90s before replacing Fred McCauley as a host of Channel 4's 11 o'clock show in 1999 which provided the platform for upcoming comedians including Ricky Gervais and Sasha Baron Cohen. In 2002, Lee was selected to present the Channel 4 post-millennium breakfast show Rise alongside Edith Bowman, Colin Murray and Mark Durden-Smith. Lee began his radio career as a presenter on XFM London from 1999 to 2001 and at LBC in 2005 where he was quickly promoted to the drive time slot between 4 and 7 p.m. After a brief spell on Absolute Radio, Lee joined the BBC Three Counties Radio before finding his spiritual home on Talk Radio from 2016. I caught up with the broadcasting maverick ahead of his new nightly Twitch show, The Late Night Alternative, to talk TV, radio and his recollections on a varied career in British broadcasting. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Ian Lee. See now, every, um, every time I see someone with a haircut, I'm like, what is going on there? Because the state, I mean, I've just watched this, so the state of it though. And it's surprising that all the Premiership footballers have all got uh, professional hairdressers for girlfriends because they've all come back with <laughs> immaculate haircuts. I'm booked in for July the 6th, 10 a.m. I've booked in for a haircut and I'm going to feel like a beautiful yeah. gentleman again. <laughs> <laughs> See you both this morning. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, thanks for coming on. Thanks for agreeing. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, so Josh has written all the questions down for me. Beautiful. Um, and... I'll read them out exactly as he's written them, and then I'm sure, I don't doubt for one second that he'll be chipping, he'll be chipping in. <laughs> but, um, chip whatever you want, Josh. It's all good. Everything's up for grabs. Yeah, nice. Yeah, if he's got it wrong, just yeah. say. Oh, I'll tell, it. I'll tell him to fuck right off. Good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, right, I'll... Let's get going. You can um, ask me anything. Go on. Brilliant. So, firstly, I uh, believe you have some exciting news for late night alternative fans. When can we hear the new show and how difficult is it to launch a show in such bizarre circumstances? Um, here's, okay. So, anyone who was listening to me on the radio knows that I got let go from the radio. It wasn't really a sacking. They just said, we don't want to renew your contract and you can't come back on to say goodbye to everyone. And I was broken hearted. Because um, I thought I loved that show. I thought I loved it. But it was, a, it was a very toxic. And I have to be careful what I say because they still owe me some money. So I don't want to, you know, if you, if you ask me these questions in a month, I might be a little bit more forth- forthcoming. It was turning into kind of a toxic environment in terms of the politics of that radio station. Did not sit very comfortably with my, you know, slightly left of centre politics. Um, so I was broken hearted. And devastated as anyone is when they lose a job, you know. Um, but there was a, there was a chain of events. Jeremy Vine, bizarrely, who I don't know very well at all, did a tweet saying, "I'm really sorry you've lost your job. I think you're really good." Twitch, the online streaming service, saw that tweet, saw that I was signed up to Twitch, and they came to me and said, "Would you like to bring your radio show over to Twitch?" And I went, okay, make me an offer. And they made me an offer. And it it was all right. You know, it's not millions. I'm not going to get rich on the back of this, but it's enough for me to pay my bills. So starting at the end of July, I'm aiming for July the 20th, but it's kind of up to them, really. We're just waiting for a contract. But I'm aiming for July the 20th, five nights a week, three hours a night. The show, The Late Night Alternative with Ian Lee, is uh is is going to be online on a streaming service you'll be able to listen to it on twitch you'll be able to watch it on twitch i should say that i'm so rubbish at promotion uh, you'll be able to watch it on twitch.tv slash ian lee there you go <laughs> um it will then the video will then get uploaded to youtube so you can watch it at any point 
And the best, like the best 45 minutes, if we can get that much together, is going to go up as a daily podcast. So basically, the show is moving online. The only difference is sometimes you'll be able to see the callers. You can see me. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I did a little test last night, and the technology works, and people called in. And oh, there's my phone. Let me turn my phone off. People called in, and um, uh, it was funny. And you asked about difficulties of launching something during this. This is the best time to launch an entertainment, I don't know, brand or whatever. It's the best time because actually, you know, it would have been better two months ago because you've got a captive audience. You've got people at home. You must know, right? You've caned Netflix. You've, you're bored of playing all the video games. You know, you've done everything. When we're in lockdown, we've, I've done everything that I want to do. I'm bored. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of a great time to launch something new that you can watch on your telly or your computer or your phone, or you can download the podcast the next day. Um, Cause you've got a captive audience, yeah. you know, although lockdown's over. <laughs> no one's really following it. We're all going to die of COVID-19. <laughs> that uh, leads us on pretty well to Josh's next question. Not about dying, but, just okay, good. What, what do you, you think happens when you die? Good question, Josh. <laughs> I've been thinking about that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. We'll save those ones for Ricky Gervais. Okay. <laughs> so uh, would you say that radio is going through a bit of a renaissance thanks to the podcasts and the rise of online radio services? And how do you think it's impacted on what you do and what uh, like other radio DJs are going to be doing in the future? I've got really mixed feelings about radio partly because I just lost a job in radio. So I have to couch this with the fact that there is an element of bitterness and sadness, you know. Um, uh, radio is definitely going through a renaissance because of lockdown in as much as the listening figures are through the roof, you yeah. know, uh, and, and particularly speech radio, music radio. No, online streaming service like Spotify, the figures are down. Um, but radio and in particular speech radio, so LBC and F uh, Five Live and, and places like that, they're through the roof. But I have to be honest, I think I don't really listen to music radio myself, so I can't comment on that. Speech radio for me uh, is really boring at the moment. It's really boring. It's very right wing. You know, and there's a lot of people have started. There are elements that are left wing or centrist. You know, you could look at James O'Brien and Sheila Fogarty. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of right wing shit stirrers. It's gone back a lot to that thing of and I'd never I used to play this game years ago and I stopped a while ago. I say something controversial about people that look different to me. People phone up and argue. So, you know, for a while it was, people would go on and say controversial things about Muslims. Then for a while it was people would go on and say controversial things about uh, Remainers. It was generally coming from the point of people that voted to leave. Yeah. Um, recently, there's been a lot of calling out people. I don't know. It's, there's a lot of shit stirring going on and it's a game that I don't like playing and i've forgotten the second part of your question you'll find this josh I, I i go off on tangents and ramble and then i forget what the hell i'm talking about yeah so you'll have to remind me a bit like him he said so don't you know, don't worry about that um he's just asking sort of how you think it's going to impact on you know the i suppose the future of sort of here's he, here's my mantra at the moment uh, 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 and i'm i'm it's a cute little line. I, I don't know how true it is, but I think radio is for me, the creativity in radio is dead. There's no creativity. There's no, there's very little, there are exceptions everywhere, but there's very little creativity. It is driven by numbers. It is driven by um, causing fear and division. Um, and you mentioned podcasts, podcasts, the radio industry doesn't really understand podcasts. When I was at talk, they wanted to get rid of my podcast, even though last year it got 3 million downloads, which is huge. Yeah. But they did, they wanted to get rid of it. Um, and I think it's because a lot of traditional radio people are scared of podcasts and they don't understand streaming. This thing I'm doing on Twitch, I was saying for 
pretty much the four years I was at Talk, we should be streaming this online. And they kept saying, no, we won't. I kept saying, this is, this is, the, this is the future. He's streaming this online, making radio a visual experience. It's still audio for those that just want to hear it, but it also can be a visual experience. Um, and Talk wouldn't get it. And for ages, I was fucking around, excuse me, I was messing around in the studio and I was setting up cameras and I was trying to stream it. And my bosses kept saying, you can't do that. It set me up perfectly for Twitch. We're now in this world where there are so, there's so much choice, right? You can find a podcast or a Twitch stream or a YouTube channel on anything you want, right? Now, those people might not get huge figures, but for a lot of people, it's not about the numbers and it's not about the money. It's about making something they're passionate about. So whatever you're interested in, Someone will have done a YouTube video or a podcast explaining how you might be able to do it better. And that's incredible. That's incredible amount of freedom. Mm -hmm. So um, I think what we've got now is uh, an amazing time when anyone you're doing a podcast. Do you know what I mean? Anyone can do anything they want to do. There's a lot of crap out there. Mm -hmm. And as you, you accept, not I'm saying this is this is this is a great show. But if you, you know, if you accept there's a lot of crap out there and you're prepared to sift through it to find the nuggets of gold, there's loads of stuff out there. This is a great time for broadcasting, he said, coming to a conclusion. I think radio is dead, but but broadcasting, if that's not too old fashioned a term, is is we're about to hit the sweet spot, man. So how do you think that's going to work in terms of keeping people informed? You know, radio's always had that thing and keeping them people entertained and informed. Do you think it, over time then you'll lose the that sort of tangent of it and it will just be more entertainment based uh informed see i'm a traditionalist and i still believe the news that the bbc tells me because i've worked for the bbc i i have relative friends that work for the bbc and i know that generally i believe that generally the bbc is impartial it might get it a little bit wrong that way they might get it a little bit wrong that way but they really try really hard to, to tread down the middle. But a lot of people will tell you that is nonsense, that the BBC is left-wing biased. A lot of people will tell you that the BBC is right-wing biased. So the fact that there's all that criticism means it's doing something right. I know for a fact that the radio station I worked at is right-wing biased. And I, I have since been told since leaving, they only want, want right-wing presenters. So you listen to that station if you're from the right wing, you're going to hear what you want to hear. Here's the, here's the insane thing. We, I used to see comments for other shows on that station saying, I'm so glad to be listening to you because you're not part of the MSM, right? mainstream media. You're not part of the mainstream media. And I was thinking, but we're owned by Rupert Murdoch. You know, we are the very definition of the mainstream media. <laughs> and people thought, the, you know, idiots, I say it, thick idiots, generally racists, didn't think that, you know. Um, so being informed, I don't know. It worries me there's so much mistrust of things like the BBC because um, the BBC will be gone in 10 years. I'm almost sure of it. And then we're screwed because then it will be Rupert Murdoch dictating the news. It will be the Daily Mail um, and, 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 and we'll be screwed. Um, you know, you get all these fringe groups looking at um, get, watching – documentaries on youtube and stuff like that and getting their information about, from the internet don't, i don't trust it i don't trust anything on the internet it's a bit of the wikipedia situation where it can be edited by anybody at any time it's yeah people often would say to like, people used to find this up and say oh um the, but the obvious one was i know the truth about 9 11 it was a jewish conspiracy i go okay where did you get your information from I saw a documentary on YouTube and I, you, you, I would go, but you know, the reason it's not being shown on the BBC is not because the BBC is like a Zionist movement is because the BBC has to check everything. They have to fact check. And you could put a video up today, Josh, on YouTube saying that COVID-19 is, um, is made by the, it was made by the Chinese to, um, to kill all the liberals. Some people actually believe that. You could put that on YouTube and someone will watch that and go, oh, shit, COVID-19 is made to kill all the liberals. You know, people believe, 
some people are really thick. That's what it boils down <laughs> to. I, I, you know, some people are really thick. Yeah. Um, and some people, I don't know. So, moving on then. One of the striking things about you and your career is that you started as a stand-up comedian on the circuit during the 90s. Yes. In your opinion, was this a difficult time to start comedy, do comedy? It was the, it was, I have no idea what it's like now because I don't cast myself as a comedian. I don't go out to comedy clubs. So I've got no idea what it is now. Um, but it was, um, it was really easy in as much as there were comedy clubs everywhere. 1993, 94, 95, there were comedy clubs everywhere, man. If a pub had a room above it or a cellar or, you know, uh, I remember doing it in church halls and sometimes just everyone thought that comedy was the way to get rich. Stand up comedy was the way to get rich. Um, so there were comedy clubs everywhere. So you could go through Time Out magazine, which is how I did it because I lived in London. And, you know, every night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights, there'd be 50, 60 comedy clubs on. You just phone them up, say, can I have an open spot? So in terms of that, it was easy. In It was quite mean on the comedy circuit at that point. It was very cliquey. And I, I've been told by some comedians, actually, that it's not as mean now. It's actually more of a supportive environment. But it was very, very mean. And once people kind of got up a certain level, they would look down on everyone below them as opposed to trying to help them and give them advice and stuff. So it was very mean. I always felt like an outsider doing stand-up comedy because I could never quite get... I was never a very good stand-up. I, I, every now and then, like, one gig in five would be good one gig in 10 would be brilliant and the rest were, were not great. Um, I, I, and I was really shy and I, I didn't really have until I met Mackenzie Crook doing a gig until I met him. I didn't really have any friends in the comedy circuit. And so I would, you know, travel all over the country on my own, rock up, go, hello, I'm the open spot, do my 10 minutes um, and then go back home. And it was a very lonely strange experience it, it it set me up for what i'm doing now it's got i've picked up a lot of skills from it but it was it's not something i look back on fondly really yeah obviously that that paved the way a little bit and sort of got you into being able to get the hosting role on yeah. the 11 o'clock show on channel yeah, four yeah. so to, to what extent do you did you sort of realize how influential that show would be on the comedy landscape of the next 20 years? Well, I, who'd have known? I mean, the two big stars to come from that are Ricky Gervais and Sasha Baron Cohen, right? Who for a while were the two funniest people on the planet, multi-millionaires going to Hollywood and making movies. I knew they were good, but when I was, you know, when I'm sat there and I knew they were good, it was obvious they were brilliant. It was obviously they were leagues ahead of everyone else on that show. But no, I did not realise at the time that those two, for a while, would become the hugest comedy stars on the planet. Who, who, who could have known it, you know? And also to have two people like that come out of one poxy little show is incredible. But then there were some other great people. I mentioned Mackenzie Crook. Uh, me and him were flatmates. He was on it for a series. And I always knew he was brilliant. I always knew he was brilliant. And, uh, you know, The Detectorist is one of my favourite, favourite things. People like Paul Garner, who wrote for it. Jimmy Carr was a warm-up guy for it. Charlie Brooker was a writer on it. Um, it was obviously, there was a lot of talent. I felt completely out of my league and um, would, you know, would sit there in awe of these people. Um, it's just, what, just imagine, man, what a thrill. I would sit on a desk... And Gervais would come and sit on the other side of the desk and I would I would prompt him with questions for 20 minutes and he'd do a routine. Oh, that was amazing to see. Yeah. You, know, you know, he may have gone off the boil a bit now, but that's he's he's already proven his point as being one of the funniest people ever, you know. And that was just how lucky was I to be able to sit there and just corpse as Ricky Gervais is is being obscene in front of me. It was a, it was a privilege, man. It's a real privilege. I hadn't what, thought of it like that before, actually. It was a privilege. What was your first sort of impressions of Ricky? It was... It, it, Ricky, it, it, here's what people don't know. Ricky was very nearly the co-host with me of the show before we got Daisy. Um, 
it, it, he auditioned. There was there was a lot of talk about him. It, it being me and him hosting the show. Um, and then Daisy got the gig, which is definitely the right call because she was great. Um, and then the whole, I remember the whole 11 o'clock show office was split straight down the middle as to people that thought Gervais was brilliant and wanted him on the show and people that thought he was awful and didn't get it. And I was a big fan of his because I used to listen to his, him and Stephen Merchant on XFM. And so I was very much in the side of, you've got to have him on. He's a genius. And I couldn't understand why people didn't get it. Um, but yeah, there were a lot of, a lot of arguments actually about whether he should be part of the show or not. But I always thought he was magnificent from day one. You know, you watch his stuff. Um, it was leagues ahead of what anyone else apart from Sasha was doing. And you knew it was going to be good because a week after his first appearance, this is when people had to write letters a week after his first appearance, you had a load of letters come in. And you could literally, it was half and half, half saying this guy is disgusting and disgraceful and should never be allowed on TV. And half saying this guy is just the the funniest thing in the world. And that, you know, kind of summed it up for me, really. Yeah. My sister hated him. My sister hated him. Set the tone for the rest of his career, really. He's career off the back of being a bit of a Marmite. (laughs) Yeah. And um, I'm not a big fan of the stuff he's done in the past few years. Uh, I, I do think I know. I know he'll make something great again. I know he will. Um, uh, uh, but you know, fifty th- percent th- of the team behind the office, he never has to prove himself ever again. As far as I'm concerned, you know, he's he's made some of the greatest comedies of all time. Mm-hmm. There you go. Um, so, two thousand and two. Now you braved the world of breakfast TV when you presented Channel 4's Rise. Oh God. Uh, as a direct replacement for the big breakfast, how much yeah. how much pressure did you feel like you were under to reignite the popularity of its predecessor? <laughs> I didn't feel under any pressure. And I'll tell you why. Because the big they asked me to host the big breakfast before it ended, and I knew it was going to end, so I said no. Then they had then 9-11 happened. 9-11 happened um, at some point. I can't remember if that was before or after the big breakfast, but everyone thought that kind of rolling news was the way forward. So Rise started for about a year without me. And it was Mark Durden Smith. It was five people behind a desk and it was very, very dry. And after a year, they asked me to host it. And by that point, that Rise had already tanked. So I knew I couldn't do any worse than that. So I didn't feel any pressure. I didn't feel any pressure. Um, Rise didn't do very well with me. You know, there were there was one day when we registered zero viewers. We got beaten by Noddy quite a lot. Um, but I loved it. Once I got the hang of it, once I worked out, I, the first three months I was really struggling. And then I had an epiphany after three months where I thought, this, none of this matters. It doesn't matter. And this has been a great philosophy, a philosophy for me on everything I've done since. It just dawned on me. I was really stressing about doing a live show. And I couldn't relax. And at three months in, I just realized this doesn't matter. This, is, this, this, this TV show now doesn't matter. And once I realized that, it became a joy. The last nine months were a joy. I could do anything. It was a, a, a playground. And people, I remember towards the end, Vic and Bob wrote a review of it in my heroes. And I'm now kind of friends with Bob because of Rise. Vic and Bob wrote a review saying, Rise is the funniest thing I've ever seen, we've ever seen in our lives. Ian Lee looks like a young Clint Eastwood. I don't get that, but, and it's brilliant. (laughs) And and that for me, that was enough. Vic and Bob loved it. And I get people now coming up saying, I used to love Rise. I used to be late for college because I was watching Rise. Um, So I had a great time doing it. It killed my TV career, if I'm completely honest. Uh, Afterwards, I was told by Channel 4, well, we're never going to hire you again. So it killed my TV career, but I loved it, man. I had a great time doing it. (laughs) <laughs> Didn't like getting up. I had to be up at half past three in the morning. Oh, no, that's rough. No, 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 no. Did you ever do an all nighter? If you do, you want to know that how how fruity can we get in this? As fruity yeah. as you want. I was doing a lot of cocaine. <laughs> I was doing, I was a cocaine addict at that point. I was a full-blown cocaine addict. 
I was earning a lot of money and it all went up my nose. And so I was, I didn't do cocaine before the show, but I would get up, I would wait. I was a drug addict. I was a full blown drug addict. I would wake up at half three. I'd have a couple of spliffs. Uh, I'd go to work. I'd be home by 10 and then I'd be doing cocaine all day. So yes, I did a few all nighters, Josh, <laughs> and I'm not proud of it, but that's, that's just where I was. I was, I was entering insanity in terms of my drug addiction and abuse at that point in my life. Did, was there a moment where you had, how did you sort of get out of that? It was just a... um, I've been doing cocaine since just before the 11 o'clock show. Then suddenly I have money so I could afford more and more cocaine. I'm smoking a lot of weed, doing a lot of ecstasy and a lot of cocaine. It got insane during Rise because I was being paid more money than I'd ever been paid before. And I didn't really understand tax. So I wasn't saving for tax. I did a lot of cocaine halfway through rise in about june may or june of that year i started to think maybe maybe i got a problem here so i started going to na meetings but they didn't really stick rise finished december of that year and then for the next nine months i was fucked man i was fucked i was doing more and more and more cocaine at the end i was doing about two thousand pounds of cocaine a week in terms of money not in terms of waiting jesus um and i was and i wasn't working and i got in really bad trouble financially really bad and i hadn't paid my tax all of this stuff and um it was just going to na meetings narcotics anonymous i just kept going to meetings i just kept going to meetings i just kept going to meetings until after 16 months of going to meetings september the 26th or 27th of whatever that year was after rise 2004 maybe um or three or four uh i stopped stopped taking drugs it just clicked something clicked and i stayed clean for 13 years and then i got divorced or then I split up with my wife and I moved into a one room flat and I did, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. And I went insane again. And when I came back from, from Australia, uh, I thought, or oh, maybe I, I, insane. Maybe I wasn't a drug addict. May, maybe I got it. Maybe I just got it wrong. All those that 13 years ago. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to do some crystal meth drug. I've never done before. And, um, I got sucked back into it again, man. I got sucked back into the madness. I had money, I had fame, fame, um, and I was not mentally very well. So I went back out for another three months and did a lot of drugs. And then I got clean again just by going to meetings. And now I go to, uh, I'm, I'm over two years clean again. I go to meetings, doing a lot of meetings on Zoom during lockdown. And um, I can't have a drink. I can't have a drug. I can't do any of that stuff because if I have a beer, I am going to be asking you if you know a cocaine dealer. You know, that's how it, how it works for me. So, uh, so yeah, it was bad. And do you know, funny enough, I'm having a real problem with my nose. And I think it's because of the, 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 the abuse, the abuse it suffered. This nose got put through a lot of abuse. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations, congratulations, I suppose, for... Um, Thank being, you, man. Yeah. It's good. It's good. It, if, just to say, if anyone is listening and is struggling with booze or alcohol, 12-step meetings, they saved my life. They saved my life. They did it twice. It works. It really does work. It's magic. Josh said it's good that you're able to speak so openly about it. I mean, it's the... Yeah, oh, I have to. I have to. I do it for really selfish things because every time I speak about it, I rem I'm reminded of where I was and the insanity of it. And it was awful. There was the relapse. The fun bit of the relapse was going to a place knowing there were going to be drugs there. That was very exciting. And the first puff on this pipe. That was the fun bit. After that, the next three months were fucking awful. And it's the, it doesn't, it's, it's a really bad sum. 20 minutes of pleasure for three months of misery. The stats don't work out. So I do it to remind me. And also I do it because, and I used to talk about it on the radio show because I know people identify with this and, you know, people, I've had a lot of people who've come up to me and said, thank you for talking about drugs and booze because you've helped me yeah. realize that maybe I have a slight issue as well. So that's why I do it, Josh. You know, it's, um, but I have to talk about it. I have to. Amazing. And also, do you notice when I talk about cocaine, I can't stop scratching my nose. Isn't that funny? There's a proper <laughs> physical reaction there. Yeah.
so let's talk a bit um, about like sort of radio grounding. Nineteen ninety nine, you joined XFM London. Oh, yeah. How do you how do you think that sort of gave you a grounding in radio, and did it help you to define your own style at all? XFM was fun because they only gave me that slot because I was on the telly. There was a lot of that in the late 90s, early 2000s. If you're on the telly, you get a slot on radio because people would think they were the same skill. They're not. They're completely different. Um, And uh, so the XFM show was great. It was great in as much as I didn't care about it. It wasn't my main job. It was kind of like a little bit of cash on the side. So I had a slight, a slight arrogance about it. I didn't know any. I didn't know the the rules of radio. So I would go in and um, just talk shit for three hours a week. I think it was on a Sunday. I can't remember. Um, and play silly games. I got sacked from XFM twice, rightfully so, because I crossed two huge lines. It was horribly offensive. Um, I don't really think. It set my style. It, I, do you know what? I'd forgotten about XFM because I, I could really consider, I did a little radio show before that, but I really considered my start being LBC a couple of years later. But I suppose XFM was good in that I wasn't afraid of a radio studio. You know, you sit me in front of a mic and a mixer uh, and some computers and I feel I feel at home, man. I love it. It's home and it's kind of the setup I've got here in front of me now. Um, so it took away the fear of being in a radio studio um, and I guess it made me fearless of th- the rules. And, and what I mean by that is I know what the rules, I know what the legal rules are, the broadcasting rules are. I've never had an off comp, you know, I've never had a complaint upheld about me. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I can say I got sacked from XFM twice for being a dick, but um, do you know, I don't, I, I don't really remember XFM. I was I was smoking and drinking and all of that shit. So I don't really remember XFM. I remember it being a laugh. I remember it being very freeing. I remember it being a bit weird and a bit dark at times. Um, but yeah, I guess you, there is a there. You could draw a line from that to where I am today. In as much as I don't, I, I, I'm not afraid to. I'm not afraid yeah. to say stuff. You spoke about LBC there. What? How did that feel then moving on to LBC and sort of a bit of a landmark in your career? It was brilliant. LBC is what is why I'm still broadcasting now. LBC is the place that defined my, it was where I learned how to do radio. It's really where XFM was a nice little hobby uh, and I'm grateful for it. But LBC is where I learned my, my trade and I would go in. It was a Sunday night show to start with Sunday night show to start with. And I thought, I went in and did what I thought you were supposed to do on a phoning show. So I would go in and get quirky little stories out of the newspaper and go on and type up all these questions. I type up, right, the the, the, sun, the, the, the news of the world, page 17, um, uh, whatever the story was, I kind of thing. And I would type up all these questions and I would just sit there and I would read it. So there's a story in the news of the world today um, about um, Bono being an idiot. What do, and I'd read all these questions. What do you think? Question one. Question two. Do you think Bono's an idiot? Question three. Do you think Bono's misunderstood? And I would read it. And it was all right. It was all right. And I did that for a few months. And then my boss, a guy called Scott, I owe my career to Scott Solder and then his boss, David Lloyd. I owe it all to them. Scott Solder took me in one day and he said, right, the show's going really well. Do me a favor. Next time you go in on next Sunday, don't read the newspapers. I said, okay, well, what do I talk about? And he said, just talk about your week. Talk about what you did in the week. And I went, that sounds shit. He said, just do it for one show. And if it doesn't work, then we, you don't have to do it again. But just do it for one show. And I walked out of there thinking, what an idiot. That's not what radio is. That's not what radio is. And so I did it really begrudgingly. And it was amazing. It was amazing. It was, it was so freeing. And I'm smiling because I'm remembering as it started working, just my shoulders went down this freedom man this freedom and it was incredible it was the best advice i've ever been given and i'm so grateful that he gave it to me and 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 that was the moment i got it 
And again, it was that coupled with what I'd learned at Rise that none of this matters. Those two things together have made me what I am, right? They've, they've made me um, get a cult following. They've made me, you know, be constantly employed for the last 17, 18 years. Um, they, they've why I've got a career today. They've why I've won awards. It's um, it set the template for everything. You don't have to go in and talk about the news. You can talk about yourself. And that's why Josh, I talk about the mental health stuff and I talk about the drug stuff. It comes from that meeting with Scott uh, where I, I didn't get it all in that first show, but over time I learned that I can reveal stuff about me and not be ashamed about it. And also people will identify with it. And, and, and that was it. That was, that was what got me. That was what, that's what's given me a 20 year career. That one meeting with Scott. So looking back at your career, what would you say your proudest achievement is? Hmm. Proudest. I always think that's an interesting question because it can be, everybody measures pride in a different way, don't they? So some people will answer with what was the most rewarding financially or what set them up in their career. But for you, it's not the money, it's not the money. you know, I, the, I, the show I'm about to do on Twitch don't pay that much, but I'm really excited about it. Cause it gives me, it's enough to live on, gives me complete creative freedom. And we're actually making, you know, this is going to be something very new and very exciting. So, so I'm very proud of, 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 of what's going to happen, but, the proudest moment would be, God, that's such a tough question uh, because I'm, I'm hovering on two. I'm hovering on two. So I I, I, and, and one makes me sound a bit arrogant. Okay. The one that makes me sound a bit arrogant is, I'll go with this one. We had a guy phone up when I was on talk radio, me and Catherine, who I used to do the show with, had a guy phone up who had taken a drugs overdose and was dying. Okay. And, uh, I kept him on the phone for 30 minutes. He was out in the street. He didn't know where he was. And I got him to describe what he was seeing while Catherine phoned nine, nine, nine and people texted in. And eventually we worked out where he was because he could describe what he was seeing. Someone went, he's in Plymouth. That sounds like Plymouth. So we, we got, we got the exact location and, Catherine, who is brilliant, phoned up the 999 and was giving all this information to them. And after 30 minutes, and this guy passed out in the conversation and came back around, the police found him. He went to hospital. He's, he's still alive. He died when he was in hospital and they brought him back to life and he was on life support and all of this shit for ages, right? My proudest moment is not the fact that me and Catherine played a tiny part in, in keeping him alive, right? That's not my my proudest thing i suppose it's more than a moment is that catherine and i had made an environment on a radio show where this guy felt safe enough he called us yeah. when he was at his lowest point in his life and he wanted to die he called me and catherine because we had made something in a landscape of, as I said earlier, radio shows that are trying to scare you and create division and create fear and create anger. In this landscape, we had created a little three hours a night that was safe, that was loving, that was really fucking silly and dumb and stupid, but was, 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 had a, an underlying element of kindness. We didn't always get it right, but there was an underlying element of kindness. And he chose to call us. So that's my proudest thing is, is working with Catherine, who I think is brilliant. And it, she doesn't get enough credit for, the, for that, that show, that show on talk radio, making an environment where people felt, you know, you'd get a call one minute about someone um, saying that, you know, they'd stuck their fingers up at Elton John and, you know, and, and we'd all be laughing at that. And then you get a call from someone saying um, that they wanted to kill themselves. We made that. Me and Catherine made that. I'm proud of that. We made that. It's amazing. 
So we were. I haven't told Josh to fuck off yet. No, do you want to do it now? Josh, fuck off. Yeah, nice one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A lot of people have said that to him. There's oh, okay. I mean, <laughs> he, he can see it didn't even phase him. He's not. He didn't even flinch. Yeah. It just means nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Another one, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a daily occurrence. Oh, mate. I, in that case, I, I apologise for jumping on the fuck off Josh bandwagon. Yeah, you, you could have been more creative with it. Yeah, sorry, something mate. New. Just could have something new. <laughs> Um, so we kind of already know the answer to this question, but what's next for Ian Lee? It's this Twitch. Well, I tell you, there's two things. So it's this is twitch.tv slash Ian Lee, um, which is going to be a five nights a week phone in show. It's free. If you want to watch it, it's free. If you want to get the podcast, it's free. There are ways you can contribute if you want. But otherwise, it's free. Okay. And and, and for those that don't know, Twitch is, is kind of like a more interactive YouTube. Got a lot of people who are a little bit scared of it, but it's fun right so there's that which i'm really excited about but more ex- more excitingly i might be going back to college in september i've been thinking for a while a couple of years now well i've been thinking for about 10 years i don't know if i want to do i'll say it just because it's a lazy term but it's a horrible term show business forever and the last couple of years i've been really thinking i want to get into um counseling and really thinking it a lot and partly because of you know we talk about the guy that phoned in who was suicidal we've had a lot of quite heavy calls and I think I'd be quite good at it and for the last few months I've been really looking at it I'm going well maybe I could make it work maybe I and then suddenly I lost my job and it was like oh oh maybe maybe I could actually do this then um so I um at the end of July, I'm doing a four day intensive course on counselling to get you to get me my grade two certificate that I would need to then go on and get a diploma. And I and if I enjoy that four days, I'm hopefully going to go to college in September this year, hopefully this year, maybe next year. I might do the four days and not like it. And that's that. But if I enjoy it, then, yeah, I'm hopefully going to go to college in September um, for a two year diploma and become a counsellor. The Twitch show would pay for that. Um, and then at some point in the next two, four, five years, I would like to leave this business and become a full-time counsellor. And then maybe, you know, if I got offered like another I'm a celebrity type thing that is not much work and is a lot of money, then maybe do something like that just to bank the check. Yeah. Um, but I am... I am seriously and it excites me even thinking about it i'm getting a little buzz thinking about it i'm looking at knocking all this nonsense on the head and and becoming a counselor yeah and i suppose with the twitch thing that's a platform that would kind of combine both where it's so interactive and people can yeah type in the comments and everything and People can phone in on the Twitch show as well as type in. So it's still okay. a phone show. But so, yeah, people can phone in and share stuff. Um, and uh, But, yeah, I'm so excited at the thought of not having to constantly hustle, you know, having to hustle. And this Twitch thing is great, but there's a lot of hustling in it because I have to keep tweeting about it. I have to keep doing Facebook posts and keep, you know, taking pictures of me going like that and don't forget to listen to my show and all of that. And I'm nearly 50, man. And um, I don't, I don't enjoy the hustle. I'm looking forward to the Twitch show a lot. I don't want it to sound like I'm doing this begrudgingly. It's going to be a lot of fun. But I'm looking forward to a time when I can just kind of fade away from all of this stuff and and go off and do something else. Yeah, amazing. Well, that's all the questions that we've written down. Three, yeah, two, three, easy, easy, <laughs> We've never had an interview like this before. No, it's been brilliant. Yeah. Well, well, hang on. Are you, Josh? Are, are you saying it's because it's good or because it's the the, the yeah. works? Yeah. Yeah. It's good because no one's normally 
this honest the whole way through. Do you know what I mean? Normally it takes about <laughs> half an interview for people to start relaxing a little bit. Yeah. And realising we're not some weird <laughs> punk who's <laughs> going to... Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, you are. But... You are. <laughs> I've got... I always think, if it's something like this, if this was like, you know, on, on, on some TV shows, I'm a little cagey but if I'm doing an interview, there's no point in I'm doing an interview. You know, I'm going in. Josh, can I ask why are you doing this? Um, oh, oh, Um, he just said he's always been fascinated with the entertainment industry. And Josh went to uh, uni and then got a master's in script writing. Oh, wow. Um, and it was just very difficult because of one thing or another. There's not what I'm making excuses about it, but for one point or another, it's hard for Josh to get people to read his stuff. Um, yeah. And right, you had, had a few things that you'd written um, and it got well received and some very important people said it was great. It doesn't go anywhere. And so about, how long ago, about four years ago? About four years ago, Josh wrote a documentary um, about sort of theatrical agents and how in like the 70s and 80s, how it was sort of somewhat monopolised and it created like a, a whirlwind for those huge stars, you know, like your Bruce Forsyth and people like that, to, but then they rode the back of that wave mm. up till now. Um, and again, that sort of got a decent amount of interest, but nothing major. There were some radio, like uh, Radio 4 and stuff, was sort of interested in it, but it never really goes anywhere. And quite impatient. So we just decided to make that ourselves. Um, so we made that. And then afterwards, we'd done so many interviews when, when we were doing that show because it was made up of people, people's own stories and people's stories of certain people um, that were sort of important, I suppose, back then. Um, and then Josh sort of said, well, I wonder if we could keep doing it because I don't want to stop interviewing people just because that project's finished. So then we started the website and... Yeah, Josh wrote his autobiography at the same time. We started the website and Josh wrote his autobiography while we were doing the website and we managed to we start off. We didn't really know how it was going to go, did we? We got a, quite a few people say yes to start with. And then after that, you just, once you've got a few, it's not too bad. It's getting we were really lucky. On board, isn't it? Let's, yeah, let's... we were really lucky. We've, got, we've, had, we've had some, you know, we've had some luck, I suppose, along the way. And we've had some really good interviews. Um, it's just again it's the same as everything though isn't it it's getting to a certain point and then getting people to see what you're doing yeah to, you know say they like it or not like it would you guys come on my new show of course <laughs> would that be right? would you be up for that yeah is 10 o'clock are you are you gonna are you you gonna bed early I, you know would 10 o'clock at night be oh of course you don't go to bed till about one o'clock Getting up this morning for a 10 o'clock interview was the hardest thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, listen, uh, I, I, I'm hopefully, th th I can say this off the record. I I'm really hoping to start on July the 20th, uh, yeah. but it's just whenever Twitch comes back with the contract. So it, it might be a little bit after that. So give me a bit of time. Yeah, no but let me, um, once I've got a date that we're starting, I I'll send over some dates to you and then you guys can come on. Yeah. When do you think this will go out? Um, to be honest, where you've spoken about your new show, I'll probably edit this and get it together to go out probably maybe next Friday. All right. Well, let me know when it goes out and I'll tweak the shit out of it. Um, but all right. Yeah. As soon as I've got a date, I'll send you guys an invite over and we'll get you, um, 
we'll get you on the show. Awesome. Well, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'm going to Tesco to do a click and collect. So I'm going to have food. That's joyous. Thank you, guys. Take care. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. See you later. Thank you to our guest for being the subject of another Beyond the Title interview. If you liked this, why not browse the website and see if there's anything else that takes your fancy. Don't forget to like our Facebook page to receive updates on forthcoming interviews and to see more information about me and what I do. Thanks again and hopefully see you next time.